your cell phone have it turned up or is it to silent? Ladies and gentlemen, have ever tried to lose weight? Uh, as summer is coming, a lot of people are interested in losing weight to become healthy or to look good. There are various ways to achieve this, but it is hard for many to maintain their desired weight. For these people, today's speaker, Maria Lisa, will give us tips for how to lose the weight in the female. She admits to having been weight all her life, but she recently lost 13 full kilograms in five weeks after being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So she certainly has a weight loss story to share. As many of you know, Maria Lisa is a board member of the GSC as a professor of in the Department of Public Administration and Social Welfare and Sustainability. In fact, she is so familiar to many of you guys that the only remaining mystery about her is how she was the weight. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome her with a big round of applause. I lost 13 kilos, not 30. <laughs> <laughs> so, and while I'm a board member and I'm a professor, I'm not a doctor, okay? So what I talk about today is simply my story, my weight loss story. And this is something that I've said many times, so I came to say it here because uh, I, I have a lot of good learning from this experience and I want to share it with everybody. So let's get started. Uh, you can't see me real well there. Can we turn the light off? I'm very cute. <laughs> yeah. So this is me on my first birthday, and I'm playing in uh, the chocolate frosting that was left over from my cake. So was I destined to be fat ever since my first birthday, letting me dive into the chocolate and smear it all over my face? So. In some ways, my exploration about my diabetes has uh, focused on me. Uh, am I just weak that I've put myself into this situation, or has my culture contributed that? And I'll talk about that today. So here we go back in time, and here is even more back in time. So more pictures of me and my family. I come from a large Catholic family. And these are my brothers and sisters, maybe 2002, right? So in terms of the 1960s, when this was taken, to the 2000s, of course we're adults now, but also you can see all of us, right, are obese, right? My entire family. So this is very typical American family in a lot of ways, right? And all of us, my whole family, have struggled with our weight our whole life. So I'm uh, primarily my ethnicity is Polish, right? I'm three fourths Polish and one fourth German. Not exactly tiny people, right? They're usually kind of the peasant stock. That's where I come from. Pull the plow and have the baby at the same time. That is probably what my body, you know, has been uh, what built for and survived for. So growing up, um, growing up, uh, my parents, right? Uh, this is me, and my brothers and sisters are much older than me, all right? So my parents were in their 40s when I was born. So, and while these days that's getting more and more normal, at that time it was quite unique. And I grew up in the 70s, and I don't know if you guys really know, but in the 70s in America, kids were kind of like kids in Korea now. We could kind of run wild. No one really needed to watch after us. We didn't have helicopter moms you know, at the time. So uh, basically in the morning, I was a morning, I, my whole life I've been a morning person. I would wake up and nobody else would be up and nobody would make me eat breakfast. So I would just go and do whatever I wanted to do. I took myself off to school, things like that. Uh, lunch, uh, when I was in grade school, my mom would give me 50 cents and I would go to school and I was supposed to buy a hot lunch with my 50 cents, but instead, I bought a chocolate milk for, I think, six cents, and the rest of the money I saved. And then after school, I would go to Burger's Dairy, which was this wonderland of candy and chocolate. And nobody really stopped me from doing those things while I was a kid. 
because nobody was really around. I had working parents, which at the time was still unusual. And my brothers and sisters were either in college or in high school doing their own thing. So I could kind of do whatever I wanted. So when it was finally dinner time, of course I didn't want to eat any food because I had been eating junk all day. And my father um, uh, didn't want me to grow up because he didn't want me to clean it up, basically. So uh, he would just be like, you know, just do whatever you want. So I would drink my milk, I would make, eat the potatoes, but any other vegetables or meat, yeah, no, not for me. So growing up, I just was not encouraged or demanded. It wasn't demanded of me to uh, think about eating as something that is just to keep your energy. It was just something that I didn't have to do. And then in high school, it just kind of get, got worse. Still no breakfast in the morning. I would go to school, my lunch would be a Diet Coke and a Snickers, and then after school, I was in sports. So I would do volleyball or have cheerleading practice, spend an enormous number of calories exercising, and then I would have fast food for dinner because I didn't want to eat what my parents had prepared at home. So over all that time, I never developed a really good eating habits. So when I went to university the first time, I went to flight school at Purdue University, and uh, it was a big party. No parents, things like that. And typically in America, they joke about uh, when girls go to college for the first time, they gain the freshman 15. Well, my freshman 15 was a freshman 25. So I gained an enormous amount of weight because I had stopped working out as much as I had been, and I was drinking alcohol and really just probably eating much more at night than I had ever eaten before. So new habits that were very detrimental to me. And uh, I made it through like a year of flight school and then dropped back, dropped out and moved back home. And uh, during that time, when I moved back home and then when I went to college again at Loyola University, I was much more healthy. I paid attention to my diet and exercise much more. But I was never thin. So all of this time, right, I was on the heavier side, but I was still very athletic, so my weight never stopped me from doing anything I wanted to do. And when I came to Korea the first time, which is, I think, 17 years ago, uh, I lost about 15 pounds, but nothing sensational, right? So, um, and in 1999, I moved back to Chicago, and from 1999 to uh, 2003, when I came back to Plumju, I gained 35 pounds in those four years. Um, looking back, I was like clinically depressed. Like, at the time, I was never diagnosed that way. But looking back with the amount of weight and just with my uh, what, attitude and mood, and <laughs> when I came to Plumju, oh my god, right? So I, I was the biggest I've ever been. Right? So this is 10 years ago that I came to Guangzhou, and I was 50 pounds heavier than I am right now. So 10 years ago, I arrived at Guangzhou, or I arrived in Guangzhou, I'm teaching at Chunde, but at Chunde, at the time, I was teaching in the language center, and we had two types of classes. We have classes at night or in the early morning in the language center, so they were all in one place. But then during the day, we taught a global English program. And I was required to go all over campus. And if you guys know Chunde's campus, it's quite large. So I would have 10 minutes, and I would have a 20-pound bag of materials going right to these different places. So I'm running all over campus in the heat, which I'm not used to. And on top of it, I lived in Kyosu Apartments, and I lived on the fourth floor. So I was having to hike. Now, when I lived in America before that, I would wake up usually about 3 in the morning, take the train into Chicago, so I'd be sitting the whole time going into Chicago, go to my 9 to 5 job, uh, sitting down all day long, get on the train, come back to Indiana, then in the evening I would go to class. So I would be sitting from like 3 a.m. until 10 p.m. and then not getting enough sleep, right? But I didn't really do anything active. And really, I didn't eat that much. But what I was eating was really poor quality, high fat food. So I had gained all this weight, even though I had a very hectic lifestyle, it was not a very active lifestyle. And then suddenly I come here, 
And I'm busy, like I was busy before, but I'm moving more. And uh, within six months, actually I think three months, within three months I lost, uh, what, 30 pounds? Within three months? And within six months I had lost 40 pounds. So, and that was, I was hardly healthy, I was still going out a lot partying and things like that. But I think the drastic dis uh, difference from a sedentary lifestyle to an active lifestyle made a difference. So even though I had lost that 40 pounds, I was still no way, shape, or form um, skinny, right? So uh, I, over the years, um, uh, gained a little bit back. Somehow I went to Mongolia for a holiday for one week and gained 10 pounds that I could never lose again. And uh, I got a second master's degree from 2007 to 2009, and uh, I gained weight. So I would forget to eat, and then I would order pizza, because that's the only thing that I could get a hold of. And that pizza would be my breakfast, lunch, and dinner for you know those number of days that it would last. So not healthy eating, creeping up. But then, 2010, my mother died from uh, diabetes. She had a limb removed, and it became gangrene. As well, she was 82 years old. Her kidneys and also her heart were starting to fail as well. So all complications of diabetes, which she had had most of her adult life. And to me, I, I watched her die, right? So it was just kind of like, you know, this, this is me. You know, this is me in 40 years. So do I want this? So I had started making small changes, getting rid of uh, different things in my diet that were unhealthy, exercising more. And really, over like the two years, from 2010 to 2012, I lost about um, 10 kilos effortlessly, just you know, doing some small things. And last November, I go to the doctor and I think, oh, hey, I'm even more active than I've ever been. I'm going to get this big pojang of great health. Well, I don't. In one year, I went from my blood sugar being just under 100, like 99, to they clocked me at 300. Like, I should have been dead or in a coma. So my blood sugar, when I went in November last year, was over 300. And I was just so shocked. I'm like, oh my god. And it really freaked me out a lot. And when I went to the doctor, uh, he gave me pills to take, and uh, I was taking my pills, and I started exercising even more than I already had been. And on top of it, I was also reducing my food, right? Because I now watch my blood sugar. Every morning I would take my blood sugar, and I'm on the pills, I'm eating less, I'm exercising more, but really my blood sugar isn't going down, right? A typical blood sugar, uh, should be between 60 and 100. Well, mine was continuously over 100. If I could get my blood sugar un under 200, I was like, whoop, a stop. But I was, not, I was not healthy in how I was eating. I was not getting enough nutrition. And uh, I was going to the doctor like every week. And finally I got to, and he was useless. He was really, really nice. But he's kind of like, oh, you should lose weight, about 50 pounds. I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. And then I would go in and he'd, I would give him food diaries and exercise diaries. He would tell me, oh, you're doing all the right things. And I'm like, I'm doing all the right things, but I'm getting two more kilos. So I was really angry and I just let loose. And I'm like, I'm getting no support. What do I do? I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And he tells me, well, most people who start taking this medicine, usually gain between 20 to 50 pounds. I'm like, excuse me? You tell me before you give me the medicine that I need to lose 50 pounds. Then you give me medicine that, despite my efforts of not eating as much as I did and exercising more, you're telling me I'm taking medication that will make me even fatter. So I was right there, I'm like, okay, I'm done with this like medication thing. So I'm like, I, I cannot see myself taking daily medications for the rest of my life, especially if it's doing this to my body already. And we're talking about within six weeks, I was having this reaction. And 
I had done fasting before, and I thought, oh, okay, I need to get the weight off, and I need to get the weight off in a healthy way, and a way that I can watch my blood sugar regularly. And so I started exploring different things, right? So, and I kind of forgot about the rest of my stuff here. So, uh, as I was doing research about how to eat healthfully for myself, um, the food and the pharmaceutical culture of where I come from is enormous, right? Uh, I just showed you my family, right? So food is, food is our socializing, right? You get together for meals, you know? And uh, I found this just this week. I realize it's too small to read, but Scientific American had a really funny little article uh, that basically uh, was in the... Uh, uh, written by the food industry, like, hi America, we don't really want you to be healthy, okay? So it really takes all of the information that is out there and available about how to be healthy and how bad packaged food, which is the primary food, and fast food, which is another primary um, area of convenience food for people, um, how these things are uh, continuing to gain despite people's knowledge that they're not good for us. So it's really kind of a fast food nation, and you know, there's just, I, I can go, we can have literally a GIC talk every week on this topic. There is so many things about this in terms of the food industry, food distribution, the um, different uh, food and pharmaceutical uh, companies and how they are treating us and our own expectations of buying into this unpredictably. So um, it's kind of like pop a pill and then things will fix, we be fixed. And yet the pills that I was taking were actually exasperating, you know, my problem by making me gain more weight. So uh, with my diabetes diagnosis, I really had to reflect within, like whose fault is this? Is this my fault? Was I just simply, you know, like adult onset diabetes, I should be able to control myself. I should be able to control my body, my eating. I should be able to not be in this pot of people that have this disease. Or is this, um, you know, am, am I a victim? Am I a victim of companies? And I really don't buy either of those things. I don't think I'm weak, nor do I think I'm a victim. But as an educator, one of the things that I do realize is that I am not living in an, a supportive environment to help me learn to be my best person. So when we're a product of our culture, whether it's Korean culture or American culture or my, my microculture of my large Polish-American family, when we're a product of our culture, what recourse do we have to recover from unhealthy choices when they're all around us? And what do we do if we don't have a quality or a trusted you know, support system? I have lots of great friends, but I don't necessarily have people that are always going to be there about my uh, diet and exercise, right? Those are things that are usually pretty personal and that we invite people into to give us feedback. People don't usually give us feedback on those areas unless we invite this, them in. And really, I think the important thing is if we can simply change the default. Instead of having a peri baguette every block or a loteria every block, instead, if we would have an organic food shop that we could go in and get snack food, or we could go to a whole foods area that is making, you know, Things that are still, still fast food, but made from local organic products. So if we can change the defaults to something more like a raw food or a green consumer culture, I think that's very possible to take the infrastructure that we currently have and just repackage it into something that is more healthy. And uh, I think that uh, if we would do that, I would think we would see a, big dr a drastic reduction in the number of health-related illnesses. And here, I'm doing good on time. So raw food basically is just plant food in its natural state, right? And in a lot of ways, Korea is really great for this, 
right? Because there's so many great preservation processes that take raw food in Korea to try and keep it as raw as possible. And when I talk about the uh, diet that I'm following right now, I'll talk about how fermentation actually is really critical for part of this. And we see that seaweed, well, seaweed is everywhere in Korea. Sprout, sprouted seed, whole grain, beans, dried fruit, nuts. All of these are things that are very easy. As a matter of fact, if uh, when I am out and I did not prepare my fruity little lunch box or snack box, going into the convenience store, there's always some dried fruits or some nuts available. So these are good choices that are out there. Um, refined sugars are just a huge no-no that are in everything. And it's sad because actually I don't eat a lot of Korean food anymore because when I go out, there's so much extra sugar added to the chige. There's so much added sugar in each of the kachan, right? That it's just like, yeah, it might be natural sugar, but as a diabetic, I mean, you know, I might as well just pop open, you know, a Mars bar and chew on that. So it's kind of, my broad body will process it the same. And green culture, we need, we so need to start questioning where everything comes from. And we need to have much more sustainable ways of living. We don't question these things, and we need to question these things. More and more, uh, we had a talk last month about um, the global warming, and really there's so many small things that we can do uh, such as, you know, uh, not I mean, getting rid of your vehicle and depending on, you know, a bus, <laughs> a taxi, a bicycle, your feet, huge changes. Or, if you're meat eaters, at least once a week, have a meat-free day. When meat-eating people move to a semi-vegetarian lifestyle, we demand so much less, and if we could really reduce the amount of factory farms, that is an enormous way for us to help for global warming issues. So there's so many things that would help us personally, but also help the planet. And those are things that I think that we need to move towards. So I need to basically reboot my body. Okay? I needed to take some control and I needed a short-term solution. I wanted to get off the medication, and I wanted to lose some weight, and then I wanted to be able to keep my blood sugar under 100 without having to take medication, and I wanted to be able to live a life where I blocked out a lot of processed foods. I wanted to get to a point where um, candy and bread and things like that were not tempting. So I took, I, I'm, I'm very lucky. I, I have an amazing life that I'm very, very grateful for. I realize that most people can't do this, but for me, this was critical. I left Korea, and for five weeks I was in Thailand, and I was at a remote spa. Um, it was in a beautiful mangrove uh, forest. There were no stores nearby, and it was health-focused, right? So I did, I was going, five weeks, my first 10 days I did fasting, and then I took eight days off and I ate vegetarian only. They had an amazing restaurant there, right at the complex, and then another 10 days of fasting. And this seems like, oh my God, fasting, not eating, oh. But I was full all the time, because uh, the program is five times a day you go to the bar. Well, the bar gives you a juice that has psyllium, which is a fiber, and bentonite clay, which helps get rid of the toxins in your system. And this fiber helps you feel full. So I'm drinking juice, fresh juice, pineapple juice, lemon juice, or I would just have water, and I would have the bentonite clay and the psyllium five times a day. So never hungry because of that. Also, in between that, I would also take herbal supplements and more bentonite clay supplements, which would continue to help clean things out. So those types of things, I was never hungry. And twice a day, I did a colonic, which is like an enema, which for a lot of people, it's kind of like, oh my god, that's just too much. And you can modify this program in many ways. You can do a vegetable-only program, a juice-only program. There's several different programs. 
Uh, Ten days is longer than they suggest. They usually suggest three or seven day programs. I've done this before, and because I really wanted to get off my medication, I wanted to be able to have two different long amounts of time to chart my body, be my own experiment. So to make sure checking my blood sugar throughout the day, because I know exactly what's coming in to my body regularly for a, a set amount of time. So it was really able to get to know my body and how it was reacting to the environment, not just the food, in terms of my blood sugar. Now, this uh, five weeks doing nothing, basically, but focusing on myself. I think pretty much all of you know me, or know of me, or you can kind of see me now, you know that I'm a people person and I'm always doing something. So having five weeks that only focuses on me is a huge and strange thing for me to do. But actually, I am an introvert. So to me, this was incredibly delightful. It was this excuse where I'm just like, oh, I don't have to be there for anybody. This was amazing to me. So I, I did yoga, I meditated, I went to the steam room every day, I had massages every day, um, I laid in the sun, got my vitamin D, I went swimming, I did a lot of napping and a lot of sleeping. Uh, I didn't let myself uh, do any TV watching, I didn't let myself do any uh, reading that required me to think. So if I did do any reading, it was all like just candy style stuff, you know, just easy drama stuff. And so I really just tried to change my life entirely and how I live it every day, just to give my body and my brain a full rest. And uh, in the five weeks, uh, I just would wake up in the morning and I had my routine that I would work through and however I felt, if I felt like sleeping, that's what I needed to do. Um, I continued to make sure I took all of my nutritional elements to make sure things were going well. But other than that, if I wasn't up for yoga in the afternoon, no problem. I would let myself rest. If I wanted to stay a little bit longer in the sun, I would do that. So I lost 13 kilos in five weeks. and. My blood sugar was consistently under 100, and I found that my natural range of blood sugar is between 70 and 120. So naturally, without any environmental things, without diet imp impacting me, my blood sugar should be around 70 to 120. So if I'm in that range, I feel okay. And from there, right, so I had these five weeks where I'm on my own and I can do everything, control everything, and I lost a great amount of weight, but then I have to come back to real life. And when we come back to real life, we have a whole bunch of different stressors and environment that can push us to just go back to the way we were, right? So I, uh, in my research, I found a book, uh, The Four Hour Body by Tim Ferriss. Now, Tim Ferriss has written several other books. Uh, he's kind of consumed by this idea of experimentation with his life to make the smallest amount of work to make the biggest amount. It's the Pareto Principle. So basically, 20% uh, of the work gives you 80% of you know, the effect. And in The 4-Hour Body, he had an element that talked about diabetes and diabetics following the diet that he's recommending and getting them off their medication and um, living a very healthy lifestyle. So I found this book and it was well-timed. Uh, so when I came back, I followed what he recommended. And um, in his book, uh, The 4-Hour Body, basically it's four hours a month. You work out only eight times in a month, twice a week for 30 minutes. So. Exercise must be measured and controllable. He doesn't consider jogging, exercise, or things like that. It's mostly weightlifting. So it's eight weightlifting things a month. So that's where the four hour comes from. But the actual diet, because he says if you think, okay, I'm 100. So if you're going to, if you want to change your body, you're gonna have three things you can manipulate to change your body. You can change your exercise, you can change your food, and you can change the pills to help you, or any sort of supplements, things like that. And we do that in different ways. We can do maybe 25% exercise, 
50% uh, food and 25% pills. Now pills will give you quick results, but very poor long-term effects. Food is one of the biggest things that uh, we can control, right? And exercise is something that we can control as well. So he recommends uh, a six-day diet. Six days you follow this diet, seventh day you do what you want. Included in his process is a cheat day. So you can do whatever you want. So he says no white foods. No white foods include no sugar. So almost no packaged foods are possible. No bread, no rice, no potatoes, no dairy. So I think many people today might have only eaten those foods, right? <laughs> so it's pretty hard to get around, get away from that. And uh, for me, here in Korea, it would be lovely to go and have a Korean uh, meal, but many of the sauces have sugar in it, even though you know, it might be a, a, a kimchi. There's still sugar added. So I have to be really careful about that. But the one thing, because I've experimented on one of my friends as well, that is the key thing, and if you want to lose weight, this is one change that I will recommend to you, is eating 300 grams of protein within 30 minutes of waking. So if you guys chart what you're eating in the morning, you will probably find that you do not get enough protein throughout the day. And if you have 30, 300 grams of protein in the morning, within 30 minutes of waking up, this charges your whole body into being more fat burning. Now, my friend, she eats white foods during the day, but every breakfast she eats, I'll show you a, an example menu of what she eats for breakfast, uh, and within three weeks she's lost two kilos, doing nothing except changing her breakfast style. And she was a regular breakfast eater as it was. So this one, and she's actually eating more calories than she had been at breakfast, but she's lost two kilos. Um, you should start each meal with a healthy fat. Uh, healthy fats could be nuts or butters, like peanut butter or almond butter, sunflower seed butter, or it could be olives or avocados. And during each meal, you should eat lemon. Uh, putting lemon in water is a great way to get that in. Um, if you want to do supplements, these are the supplements he recommends. Cinnamon, ginger, garlic, and red pepper. All of those are really good to increase your metabolism and your fat burning uh, experience. You should drink green tea every day. It helps not just with keeping you healthy, but it also keeps uh, your body burning at a higher rate. And throughout the day, you should have a couple mouthfuls of kimchi, pickles, or sauerkraut, something that's been fermented. So it's one of the best things to help our digestive process and to keep things moving because uh, the sooner things go in and the sooner things go out, the less the unhealthy stuff stays around to get into your bloodstream and the less uh, your organs are required to try and get rid of those toxins. So let's take a look at the menu. Not so exciting, okay? So for breakfast, uh, starting with the healthy oil, um, like walnuts. So popping a couple walnuts in your mouth while you're making your breakfast is a good thing. And then you should have protein. Uh, eggs are good protein. And uh, slow carbs. He calls this the slow carb diet. Slow carbs are beans or lentils. So basically, you're replacing all of your white foods with beans or lentils. So if you eat enough beans or lentils, because you can eat as many as you want, this will help you feel full so you don't get cravings for other foods. And then unlimited greens and vegetables. I like kale and broccoli because they have some of the best vitamins and minerals uh, per amount. Uh, lunch, uh, starting with you know a couple olives, and then you have a salad, and you can have meat or fish or seafood. And then I like to have like uh, bell peppers and tomatoes, right? Because I think that is a good mix of more antioxidants and different kinds of, uh, what, the lecithins from the tomatoes and the carotenes, and uh, more beans and lentils for lunch. And then for dinner, uh, you can, I like to make my own little uh, appetizers. I put a, a, a walnut and an olive together, oh, really amazing. 
and uh, then beans, beans, meat, and I do my cruciferous vegetables in the evening. Uh, cabbage, uh, more broccoli, Brussels sprouts, um, uh, cauliflower, okay, those are really good. And I have more greens. I stay away from root vegetables. Root vegetables have a higher glycemic index than other vegetables do. So I do eat them, but I try not to. So stuff like um, even onions, right? Onions, um, potatoes, carrots, um, ooh, radish, right? It's so hard to stay away from radish. So, um, so those I try and stay away from. They do come in when I'm eating out, but when I'm at home, I never buy that at home. And snacking, you shouldn't have to snack. If you are hungry, eat more beans or lentils at your meal. Increase the amount of beans or lentils that you're eating at the meal, and you should not want to snack. Um, but if you do want to snack, um, celery and like peanut butter and jelly, right? Uh, or like 100 grams of nuts. Measure your food, okay? That's the other thing that you really uh, encourages. So this is a sample menu of what I'm doing now, okay? And uh, instead of having bibimbap, I encourage you to have bibimcom, okay? Change your rice to beans. So do the same thing. You've got an egg in there, you've got some great protein. Uh, the fats, you've got sesame seed oils and sesame seeds. Those are really healthy fats. And then this particular bibimbap, you could also still put tuna in there or meat, right? And you have other vegetables. Probably on this picture of bibimbap, the mu with the in the red sauce is probably something I wouldn't eat because I wouldn't know how much sugar they added in their preparation of it. And just switching out the rice for beans. And if you're going to eat beans, black beans are some of the best beans for you in terms of uh, Helping, what? It's the lowest glycemic index, but also it is, oh, I can't remember now. There's just so many other good things. I think the lowest calorie, too. So uh, this is not a calorie-watching diet. I don't watch my calories. I watch for balance of the different kinds of food. And uh, also, I, these things I hear a lot of people complaining about hair loss. If you have problems with your hair, eat black food. Eat some black beans. Just change your rice to black beans for a week and you'll have luxurious hair, I guess. All right. So that wraps up my story. Okay. So I hope you change your default on eating. Awareness is the most important thing. If you don't, you should probably do some meditation. But one of the reasons why I've been able to make this switch relatively easily, because it's really, really hard, is because I meditate. I continually try to bring awareness, like, ooh, that cupcake looks delicious, but I've had many cupcakes in my life, and I really don't need that. <laughs> right? So talking to my food, you might see me doing that, right? So that might happen. Um, I hope you become more conscious about your food, um, your exercise, and your pill practices. You don't have to live a life that the doctor tells you to be on, or that the commercial tells you you need. Please, please question. Maybe you'll find that that pill or that food or that exercise is something that you need to be healthy. But make it your choice, not someone else's recommendation. Do your research and make your own deep decision making on that. Reflect. Um, I hope you support me and others as we work on our well-being. Okay? And uh, please, if I'm out with you, please don't get upset if I won't eat rice. It, this, this one thing is the most difficult thing for me since I've been back. Because I, I have Korean people literally like, oh, you must be starving me, your rice. And it's kind of like, please, right? Respect me. So, and um, I have an addiction. My addiction, I'm a chocoholic. As I showed you the picture, since I was one year old, that I've been hooked. Okay, so it's been a long, long time. So please offer me water or some green tea instead. Okay, and really thank you so much for listening. Oh, I ran away. Don't run away. We have questions. So uh, now it's time for the uh, Q&A portion of our talk.
If you didn't get a piece of paper, please raise your hand and one of our uh, one of our volunteers will come and bring you a paper uh, where you can write the questions and I will ask the questions. So Maria, while you're taking your little bit of water. And my little uh, bit of a walk, it all goes together, right? A little bit of exercise. So thank you for your talk. Um, you are something of a fixture here at the GIC, so many people know about you. Uh, but one thing that you talked about today is your uh, family background, being three quarters Polish. So let's tie those two things together. Is there any favorite Polish food that you have? Pierogies or? Uh, I, sauerkraut is probably my favorite food. Sauerkraut and then Polish sausage. So Polish sausage is a white sausage with garlic inside of it. Uh, so it's really spicy. Um, pierogies, I, I didn't grow up with those as much. Like, I don't know, maybe my mom was lazy and didn't know how to make them, I don't know. But we had cabbage rolls more often, and I really didn't like those when I was young. So uh, Polish sausage, kielbasa, and kapusta. That's my favorite. <laughs> OK. So let's, let's get into your uh, talk today. Um, you've been in Korea for a while. 17 uh, years. 17 years. Yeah. 17 years this February, 10 years in Gwangju this August. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as, many, as many Westerners know, Korea is a, is a fairly skinny developed nation. Um, not anymore. Chubby people are everywhere these days. <laughs> <laughs> You're stealing my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, one one person in the audience notes that um, shaming shaming is a part of the culture here, and shaming fat people. And do you think that the the culture of shaming people for being overweight? Uh, does it have an effect here in Korea, and do you think that's useful or ultimately counterproductive? Uh, so I'm going to stage my answer in a couple ways. When I first came to Korea, finding a fat person, a fat Korean person, almost impossible. You get on the subway, everybody's short and skinny. When I came back in 2003, I was astounded how tall people were and how chubby people were getting. And these days, as I walk around, I am shocked at how heavy almost everyone is. Like, it, it's, it's not like, yeah, like almost everybody's heavy, especially if you look at somebody who is younger than 30 years old, right? So there's a drastic difference, um, I think primarily because of fast food. And fast food doesn't necessarily have to be Western food. Fast food can certainly be ramen and kimbap. kimbap when, 10 years ago, kimbap was like awesome, healthy stuff. But now, you know, it's got loads of cheese or mayonnaise in it and things like that, which, you know, aren't really, they're just empty calories. So I see a big change in that. The shaming element, I don't think has ever worked in Korea. I think that the shaming element is psychologically detrimental and does not work on reducing people's weight, it just increases their anxiety about their weight. So I think that across the board, um, the, the shaming principle just adds to more mental difficulty that people have and uh, more resistance, actually. Because um, as a chubby person, somebody told me I'm fat, just more, and I'm just kind of like, and so I get very defensive and reactive. I don't think, oh, that person's trying to help me. That's the last thing that I'm thinking when somebody calls me back. And I think that a lot of uh, my Korean friends who are heavier, um, who have lost weight, uh, have not lost weight because of shaming. They have lost weight because they personally like the way they feel better with, when they're uh, lighter, and because they've had some sort of health scare. So I think uh, what that health recognition and also uh, the feeling that you get when you're um, living a more healthy lifestyle. Push people more. Okay. Good question. It wasn't mine. <laughs> um, so you mentioned at the beginning of your talk the idea of, was I destined to be fat? 
Now, some people might be familiar with this sort of uh, colloquial American term of someone being big boned, where we have this idea that some people are just have a genetic predisposition to being bigger. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is that just an excuse, or do you think that's legitimate? <laughs> I think it's all relative. It's context-based. Because if I actually go to Poland, I'm tiny. Right? So um, I, I'm a small woman compared to uh, with Polish women of my same age. And, um, you know, so I think it's just relative to where you are. Um, I, I have a firm belief in body type. I think there's different body types that some people are more muscular than others and things like that. Um, I even think bone density is a very realistic type of calling somebody big bone is not necessarily uh, very off base about that. Uh, but I think all of those are um, ways that we have used to try and understand the uh, differences that are body types. And uh, as the world has become more and more international, the things that are usually based more about a certain context or way to talk about things are starting to fall away and we're getting better at realizing scientifically uh, what is true and what isn't true. And the cool thing that I love about technology today is we have never been more poised to not be grouped with somebody else. So all the women in here, I don't need to worry about their experience affecting mine. I can test myself. Soon we will have, with our iPhone, different ways to measure our blood sugar, our blood sugar, our blood pressure all these different ways to measure our health on our own and be able to use ourselves as a laboratory to find out what is healthy for me, not as what is healthy in general. So telling me that I'm supposed to weigh between like 116 and 140, I think it is, that's the big uh, thing uh, for my what, height. Well, you know, is that really true? So as I think we go forward with technology, I'll be able to test out see all of my uh, what, uh, measurements about my health and find out that maybe you know being in that weight class actually is most detrimental for me for some reason. I'll be able to measure that and make those decisions myself. Okay. Um, you mentioned the idea of changing the default instead of having a Paris Baguette or a Loteria at every block, having healthier options. Uh, one person in the audience uh, mentions, well, they also mentioned great talk, by the way. Um, but someone mentions that they are an expat, and that they, one, the one thing they miss most from the U.S. is having grocery stores such as Whole Foods available. So do you think it's, it's possible to change the default in Korea to incorporate things like that? Whole, whole, whole Foods and healthy options. Uh, can you talk about, you know, in order for these things to succeed, you need people to support these things? Well, there is a Whole Foods, and it's called Nam Kwangju Market, or Yang Hong Market, or Hayen Market. There's lots of outdoor markets. But when you think about Whole Foods, or what is it, Trader Joe's, the two big, uh, um, what is it, chains in America for grocery shopping, you're not just talking simply about fresh produce or um, organic meats. You're also talking about a lot of crack packaged foods. And those packaged foods, um, I have seen uh, the marketing for organic packaging foods take off considerably in the past 10 years. So that's changed a lot. Um, in town, there are different organic um, shops. They have the big red ladybug. Uh, who can help me out? What is the name? Mudambale. And I noticed uh, walking from meditation last night, there was another little organic market. And they're selling organic cereals. So cereal that is made from organic items and uh, different snack foods and things like that. Um, if you go to E-Mart or Home Plus or some of like the mom and pops, you don't tend to see those on the shelves as much. But they are out there, they have increased and it's about finding a healthy Korean friend to go with you to start um, uh, what, reading the labels and helping to get that information out there. And what is it? Hormone 
Portland is a great organic resource. Very expensive for stuff, but they uh, do a lot of transparency about their foods and their food testing. Okay. Um, I was going to ask a different question, but you just mentioned the idea of how sometimes the healthier option is often the more expensive option. And that's one of the biggest problems with the obesity epidemic in the United States is the cheap processed food, the, the processed unhealthy foods are often the cheapest foods, and so you get a problem where there's obesity among the poor. So uh, can you talk a little bit about that in Korea? Do you see that being a similar situation on the rise here, or do you think we can avoid that situation in Korea? I, I can't really speak to that. I, I haven't done a study. I haven't had discussions about that. Um, I would say maybe the opposite. I think the poor kids are probably still skinny because they're not eating and they don't have pocket money. Um, and I think the kids that are fat are the kids that are coming from more affluent families. But that's that's my speculation. I have no studies or things like that that I've done. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned that the three, three ways to control weight <coughs> being healthy are uh, food intake, supplements, and exercise. Uh, so what is your usual form of exercise, and how, how long do you exercise, how much do you exercise daily uh, or not daily? Actually, I don't follow the book, because I love moving. So I exercise every day. I walk between three to six miles every day. Uh, some of it kind of hiking, right, because I live uh, near a mountain. Um, I usually, uh, I don't walk that fast, but I try to improve my speed, right? Uh, this summer I've done some biking and things like that. Uh, every morning and every evening I have a regular practice that I do of meditation, yoga, and then I bring in different uh, weight with things for arms and abdomen and things like that. Um, in terms of more aerobics, uh, it depends on if it's a rainy day, and I can't get out and walk, I might do some aerobics at home. I probably over-exercise. I probably should not do as much as what I'm doing. Um, the book, The 4-Hour Workweek, really strongly recommends that uh, on the days that you are not doing your actual weightlifting, uh, that you do nothing. Like, try not to walk around, like, really limit yourself as much as you possibly can. So, I, I just can't do that, and I don't want to do that. I feel like I have more freedom now, so I want to move more. So. Um, one of the things that you talked about at length was the medication you were originally put on after your uh, type 2 diabetes diagnosis. Uh, would you care to share the name of that medication because you, you seem to be wanting to warn people about the possibilities of this medication? Oh, I yeah, I don't, I don't know which one it was. I was on two different things, so I don't know which was actually the cause. Um, the, one of them that I was taking that I've been familiar with, that I know that my mother took, and millions of people around the world take, is glucophage. Uh, it, it's a very, very common drug for diabetics. And uh, the other one, uh, I'm not going to mention the name, because I think that was probably the one that was more at fault. But, um, yeah. So, and, and the thing is, I mean, diabetics are out there that need to take these. So this is, this is my choice, and this is my discovery and my life experiment, which continues to go on. I'm always in contact with my doctor, so you know, if my blood sugars get above what I think is normal, uh, usually I try, it's usually because of my diet, right? It's my own doing, and if I start bringing myself more in line with my healthier diet, my blood sugar goes down. But if you know I'm doing uh, the things that I'm doing right now, and I continue to see my blood sugar escalate, well, you know, the, I'm going to ask for you know physicians' assistance on that, and I'm going to also continue to ask questions online and forums and things like that. Okay, uh, a few more questions. Uh, Obviously, a big part of your story was the five weeks that you spent at the spa. There are some people who are, are uh, uh, curious about um, what, what is the price range for the various programs at the spa. <laughs> you mentioned they had several different programs. What what's the? Can you give us an idea of how costly this? Might so be? I spent five thousand dollars, so it was like five thousand a week. But I got 
massages every day. I had a steam every day. I had um, all of these uh, what uh, supplements, right, that I was taking, plus my accommodations, um, and something else was on the list. I can't remember what it is. Oh, my yoga and meditation classes too. So I, I don't know about you. I don't think that's too shabby. I mean, to me personally, I think it's expensive. But for the lifestyle I was living, I think it was very cheap. Okay. Um, one thing that's been uh, big in the news in the U.S. recently is the idea of government intervention, government regulation in food and catch, health. Catch the, soda. the big thing is uh, in New York City, city government has banned large sodas uh, at restaurants and public places. Uh, do you? What's your opinion on government intervention uh, versus people's personal liberty? And do you think something would be would, would similar practice be well accepted here in Korea? Oh, boy, this is very complicated. <laughs> so, um, uh, politically, I'm a libertarian. I don't believe in government intervention. I trust people to make good choices. However, just as I mentioned in here, I think we have a very um, disturbing environment that uh, we are uh, we have defaults in place that are not of our choosing and as we get more information about them we don't have a lot of recourse to change those easily um, without infringing on companies which I don't know how companies became like individuals because they're not individuals so um, they're a collection of individuals so you know they, they should be uh, responding to our new demands. That's to me what kind of markets and capitalism do, is companies respond to people's changing demands. But instead, right now, we're in a world that companies are allowed to act as individuals and given rights way beyond our own. And because of that uh, political uh, what, discrepancy between that, um, I feel that government intervention here, uh, since the companies won't change to our new demands, that the government is acting as a representative of the people to push companies and to penalize them for not listening um, to our demands. So, um, this next question will be the last question. Uh, your talk was obviously very interesting and generated a lot of questions. Uh, unfortunately, there's not time for all of them during the Q&A. If your question wasn't asked during this Q&A session, uh, come talk to Maria or stay for the discussion section. And if you ask me how much I weigh, I'd kick you out. <laughs> I will not answer that. So I guess I won't ask the last question. <laughs> Uh, so, last question, Maria. Don't you ever just feel exhausted from time to time? Oh, yeah, of course I do, right? So, um, you have to realize, I have, like, I, I'm single. I don't have kids, I don't have a husband. And so, because I don't have people in my immediate vicinity that are demanding something from me, I can choose my resting times. So, because I can choose my resting times, when you see me, those are the times that I am actively choosing to put myself out there. Whereas many people have made commitments to be out in the public, but yet in their home situations, they also have drama or situations that require their attention. So it's hard to be fully on when you are out for those other you know, um, obligations, or not even obligations, the other fun that you planned for yourself, you're not fully there. So I, um, so you see what I want you to see when I'm in public. So when I am, uh, and I don't think anybody, maybe Young Man might be one of the only people who has been around me where I've had no energy, right? Because I think she and I have uh, what, known each other long enough, and in the early days, I didn't have so much. Um, kind of personal control over my time. And she would see me way up and way down. So, but I, and maybe Dr. Shin as well, but not so much. So, um, so that, that's very different that way. Okay. Well, let's, uh, well, let's thank her for.
but you gave up very good tips for us to lose weight, but you need one. How to gain weight for you? <laughs> <laughs> also, the book that I recommend tells how to bulk up. And that's what I did. Thank you. So you can gain weight with the same book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But in fact, it is a kind of uh, continuous determination to keep yourself fit. Uh, for example, my wife loves meat. I love meat as well, but I decided not to eat meat. But because of my wife, I make compromise. So I eat less. I eat some more meat. She eat less meat. So uh, it was continuous struggle of about four years. So she complained a lot. Because of me, she was not able to enjoy the meat. But now she appreciates it. Uh, she does not, her heritage has a diabetes, high blood pressure, all, all family. Her mother died out of very young. Younger than she was, she is now. Uh, now she appreciates her suffering. Uh, because of her suffering, she does not have diabetes, blood pressure, but it was quite difficult for me to handle her and handle myself. People hear a lot of drinking when I was young. No drinking, no social life. <laughs> so I was kind of outcast. So it was quite difficult, but still now I feel healthier than my age groups. They were healthier than I was at that time. But they, I am healthier than most of them. So I, I, I agree with you that it is a continuous check, check up of yourself. And then, thank you. It's never too late. <laughs> so you can always get it sincerely. Uh, in fact, we owe you. No, 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 no. So uh, I gave Maria one question, but she disregarded it. Uh, it was, in fact, uh, she lives a life of determination, and then lives a life of goal. She tries to make the most of her time and whatever she has to the, the betterment of the society. And in that regard, GIC owes hundreds of this letter of appreciation. So, uh, even though it's a single letter, uh, I want you to consider this as hundreds of letter of, of, of appreciation. And then uh, we are, when we, GIC has had some difficulty, she came in find a solution. I, I think I can make a long list of, uh, of your contribution. I don't read this, but you know what I have in mind. Thank you very much for your... Uh, and when we are began the talk, you mentioned it already, we had about four people. So, just a little table in the library. So, like maybe over on this October, it will be 10 years ago. That's right, 10 years ago. Hey, thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's talk. Uh, next week, we will have a talk in Hello, the European Union by Solana Brinker. After the talk today, we will have a discussion group. So if you want to participate, please remain here and move to the front of the room following the talk. Thank you for coming today and enjoy the rest of the week. I want to add one more. Two weeks later, we are in the, uh, next week we are talking about European Union. One week, uh, two weeks later, we are inviting uh, city mayor of Timisoara of Romania. In that city, there, there began, for the first time, 
anti-communist government uh, at the time so-called riot or uprising. So many people were killed by Chao Sesco at that time. So they began the revolution of Romania and the city mayor came here, come here to talk about the revolution of Kim Isuan. It is a kind of Guangzhou in Romania. So many of you will enjoy talk by the city mayor. <laughs>